All right, let's go. So <clears throat> this is the menu that we have after lunch. Uh, first, we are going to see uh, what is uh, Zyberg uh, about. Uh, Zyberg is a, a German word. I don't, I don't speak any German, so I, I don't know why I do that to myself, but <laughs> I try to pronounce it uh, the best the best I, I can. More or less is that, okay? Zyberg. All right, so we are going to see what it's about, uh, what motivated uh, me to work on this. After that, we are going to understand how Rails uh, autoloads, how it has been autoloading since the beginning, and how is uh, Zyberg autoloading and the integration in Rails 6 because uh, Zyberg is going to be the autoloader by default in Rails 6 applications. All right, let's go. So uh, Zyberg is a, is a Ruby gem that provides these features mainly. Okay, these are the main features. The, the, the API has more stuff, but this is, this is uh, the main things that it resolves. It, out, it, it is able to autoload, it is able to eager load, and it does so without needing requires. That's the point, okay? So you are able to autoload the same way you do in Rails, and you are able to eager load as well. But if you want to eager load without writing requires, then you need to be able to autoload as well, because normally, you know, regular code has constants at the top level or class level or, you know, and they, you, 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 you do not need to order the, the way the files are loaded to be able to eager load. So for that to be possible, you eager load. For instance, Rails uh, in production mode, let's say by default, when you eager load, Rails is just, is just still auto-loading because you have constants at top level, okay? So once you have finished eager loading, then you are set. But meanwhile, you still need to auto-load. So both features are related. Then uh, uh, you are able also to reload code, which is normally something that, that uh, is convenient if you are writing a, a service, something that is running, a server, whatever. And it is important to understand that, uh, albeit we are talking about Zyberg as the, as the new default autoloader for Rails 6, uh, is an independent project and it has been designed to be able to be usable, usable in any Ruby project, all right? Indeed, it has no dependencies, so it has no, no relationship with Rails. So uh, Zyberg is an independent gem, and then in Rails, there's integration code that delegates these features to Zyberg, but by itself, it's an independent gem that can be used in any project without carrying anything. All right, so first thing first, let's see how do you use this thing. The assumption that that's the contract that the project has to has to follow is that file names have to match constant paths, all right? So this is a very conventional way to, stru to structure projects, but Ruby in general is much more flexible than that. So we put a constraint on the problem, which is this one, okay? File names match constant paths. And in, in the case of Rails, that's the way you normally write, you know, uh, project structures in, 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 in Rails applications. But this is, a, this is a given, okay? In order to be able to use uh, Zyberg in your project, you have to, you have to comply with this. So th this means, for instance, that <clears throat> if you have a user.rb, that should define a user constant, okay? A user class. User underscore profile should define the user profile in camel case constant, okay? Very conventional, right? Uh, if you have HTML parser, by default, it should, defo it, it should define HTML parser with TML as lowercase letters. But if you prefer to have those as uppercase letters, every, every instance of, of uh, Zyberg, the, 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 the thing is that your project is going to have one instance, your gem, for instance, is going to have one instance, is able to configure its own inflector independent of any other inflector, deterministic, controlled by you. So you could say in your inflector, okay, HTML is going to be inflected as HTML acronym, okay? You can do that if you want. Then uh, we have namespaces, so uh, file, uh, file names correspond to constant, constant paths. If you have a namespace, name, namespace is not like a, a, a formal word in Ruby, but since, since we have this assumption, 
uh, we, we, we know what we mean, okay? So uh, namespaces correspond to directories, easy, all right? So for instance, we have here a class hotel.rb that defines a hotel constant, but then that class also can act as a namespace. Then you have a, a corresponding directory called hotel that defines something uh, uh, beneath, beneath, um, inside it, which is pricing, okay? Very standard, very standard thing. Then also we support uh, implicit namespaces the same way uh, Rails has, has, has done since forever, which is that if you have a, a namespace called admin, you do not need to define admin in a, in a file called admin.rb. You do not need to do that, okay? If there is a, if there is a directory, directory called admin and there is no admin.rb, uh, Jiberg is going to define a dummy module for you automatically, that's transparent, okay? Rails does that, has done, has done that since forever. All right, so that's the convention. How do you use this? Very easy, you just instantiate a, a, a loader, then you, you tell to the loader which are the root directories of your project, okay? That's, this, this is the generic interface, okay? You say which are the root directories. If, if you think Rails, those correspond to what we call the autoload paths, okay? You can have many of them. Then you call setup, done. You are ready to do everything, okay? In the case of gems, there's a shortcut because in gems, um, uh, well, normally, normally a gem has a lib directory, so it has only one root path, which is called lib and normally you put this in the entry point of the gem, and normally gems inflect, especially version.rb, okay? Version.rb normally, uh, uh, conventionally goes all in uppercase. So this is just a, just a shortcut, okay? That, that configures that for you if you want, okay? Um, this for gem is called, is called for brevity, but uh, it, it doesn't technically need to be a gem. It doesn't need to, be, to have a gem spec or whatever, you know? This is just a shortcut. If your project has a leap, you know, and that structure, uh, that's, that's for gem works also that, uh, for that. But, but in, in the case of a, of a gem or a project that has a leap, you can also do that manually uh, using the, the previous generic interface, okay? Just for convenience. All right, uh, you eager load this way. You do the same thing, instantiate, root, set up, and then you can eager load, okay? And gems, I believe in general, uh, are going to eager load unless the gem is huge, okay? Unless the gem, the gem is, is, is huge and loading on demand is worthwhile, uh, I guess they are going generally to eager load, all right? Then there's a, a class method called <coughs> eager load. Uh, Zyber has a registry with all the loaders that have been instantiated. <coughs> and if you are writing a service and you want to eager load as much as possible uh, when you boot, like, like raising in production mode by default, uh, this method is going to eager load uh, all, the, uh, all the code by all your dependencies that are managed by Zyber, okay? That's in, in Rails 6 that is done for you. So in, in Rails, you are not going to need to do anything of this. That, that's, that's what the integration code does for you, okay? That it is going to be transparent, okay? So Rails, uh, when, when, when it boots in production mode by default, in the end is going to eager load everything. So you, benef you benefit from all the dependencies that are using uh, Zyberg, and of course, you, auto -load, you eager load also the Rails code. Then this is the way that you uh, reload. Uh, for reloading, you have to opt in, okay? So the thing is, this is a Ruby project uh, thought for Ruby projects. And I believe uh, the majority of use cases are not going to reload. So when you are working in a Ruby project that does not implement a service like a, a gem or a project that, you know, you do not reload normally. You only need to be able to auto load or eager load, and then you, when you change the code, maybe you run the suite, but there's nothing to reload, okay? So in the, in the API, I, I've, I've uh, treated re reloading as a special case. And indeed, then we can benefit from this because in order to be able to reload, you have to store some metadata, 
and we can save storing that metadata if you are not reloading, which is going to be the majority of the cases. For instance, if, if you have a Rails application and uh, 20 of your dependencies are using uh, Zyberg, you, are, you know that you are not going to be storing metadata from those gems that are not going to be reloaded ever, okay? So this is more, more efficient. Not a big deal in, in, in regular projects, it's not that big deal, but uh, uh, if you have like a really, really huge uh, application, it, it, could, it could save some memory in production, okay? All right, that's the basic usage of, of, uh, of uh, Zyberg. Then, why, why I was motivated to work on this? Uh, several things. The, the, the last one is the one that uh, made me start working on this, which is to improve Rails autoloading, because if you have written Rails applications, you probably know that the way constants are autoloaded has some gochas, some its cases, it, it, it is not wrong, okay? It does not match Ruby semantics. When it works, it works beautifully. When you have a problem, sometimes difficult to debug, I don't know. Um, I wanted to improve this. That, that was what made me launch the editor, let's say. But then when I was working on this, I realized that I could solve another personal pain point, okay? Which is that I don't really, I don't really like writing requires in projects, okay? Requires are brittle in my experience, and if you, you have a very small project, not a big deal. But if you have a project uh, of a certain size, um, it's easy to forget requires, and that's a pain in the ass for me at least, okay? Also some sense of dryness. If, if you write projects where the file structure is conventional and you map constants with, with file names, if I am using uh, the, the user constant and I have to require user, and for every constant that I am using in a, in, a, in a file, I have to do require basically the same thing. I have a sense that couldn't we automate this somehow, you know, because I'm repeating myself all the time. And uh, if we follow, if we, if we had a convention, maybe we, we, we wouldn't need to do this, okay? So uh, those are the things that motivated to me to work on this. For some people, uh, writing requires is fine, perfect, okay? But uh, for me, it was a pain point that they wanted to solve. So for instance, we have this, cl this class airplane that uh, includes a module. Uh, in, a, in a regular Ruby project, this wouldn't work. This wouldn't work because we have a name error because we need to require the file that defines the module, right? Okay, uh, you have to be very disciplined in any, in any project that has a non-trivial size. You have to be very careful, very disciplined, not to forget requires. And when you refactor code, you need, you need to remember to add them, you need to remember to remove them if, if you, have, you want to have your, your code base clean. Uh, it's difficult because it, it depends on your own discipline and uh, it, you cannot automate that, it, you know. But uh, the, here's the problem, the require has a global side effect. So uh, this file without the require could work. If some of the file in your code path require this module, it's already in memory, it's going to work. And then you have a bomb here because that depends on the code path. So uh, maybe in your test suite that passes, then maybe you go in a different di direction and you hit, you, you, you hit a name error, okay? And uh, I've, I've dealt with this in the, in the Rails code base uh, for a long time, like, like grabbing for missing requires for blank, for instance. You know, it, it, it's brittle. In my experience, it's brittle. I prefer, I prefer not to do this. So for instance, this is uh, the entry file for NanoC. NanoC is a, a website, a, a static site generator, okay? In the case of NanoC, uh, uh, in, instead of doing requires individually where you need, uh, it was like eager loading. In this, conceptually, this is eager loading, right? So it, it had all the requires here. These requires have a cost, have a cost, because then when you add a file to the project, then you need to go here and add it to here. And also, they have to be in order, okay? 
if you have constants at the top level, uh, you, need to, you need to require things in a certain order. So this, this needs a, a, a maintenance. So Nano C is using uh, Zyverk, and uh, the patch that uses Zyverk just deletes all this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love this patch. <laughs> so uh, uh, Nano C is, is eager loading, simply. So it, uh, the, the point is not to auto load or not. That depends on the size and the, uh, it depends on your preferences. Uh, here Nano C opted to eager load. So it just instantiates a loader, eager loads done. It's one line of code, OK? So that's the point. You can streamline your programming knowing that your classes and modules are available everywhere. Just, you just reference the constant is there, okay? The ones of your project, of course, if you are using uh, Nokogiri, you have to require Nokogiri, of, of course, you know, but the ones of your project, ev everything is, is reachable everywhere. So forget about requires if you want, okay? All right, now we are going to understand how, how Rails auto loads and uh, w which are the problems of that and how does and uh, Zyberg uh, solves that, those problems. And in order to do that, just quickly let me, let me uh, make a, a constant refresher to, to have you know, this in mind how this works, okay? Just for a moment. All right, uh, you know constants, uh, uh, here we are assigning, assigning an, inter, an, integer, uh, an integer, sorry, to the X constant. Um, in, in, in many programming languages, constants are a trivial topic. There's nothing, there's no, not much to say about them. But in Ruby, they are a very, very rich topic. And the thing is that here we have also a constant assignment, okay? Uh, sometimes Ruby programmers do not have this like, like crystal clear in their mind, but this is a constant assignment. So this is the same as doing C equals class new, okay? This class keyword and the module keyword also is just doing a constant assignment behind the scenes. So the same thing, okay? Class new gives you a class object and the class object is stored in the C constant. So C, uh, constants are storage like variable, variables are, all right? Uh, as a curiosity, the, the class object, when it's assigned for the first time to a constant, gets the name uh, the name assign it. Okay, so then you, you then so in in the right side of the of this assignment, the class that 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 returns is anonymous, but after that line is going to have a name, and then from that point on, on that name is set. There's no API to change it. You can remove the C constant. The names is still C. You can assign this class object to another constant. They, they are totally independent uh, concepts. They are like coupled just a little bit in the definition time, but from that point on, they are independent entities in Ruby, and, and that makes thinking about classes and constants, uh, you know, uh, um, there are many edge cases and, and uh, counterintuitive things if you are used to, to, to just write, you know, conventional uh, code uh, where uh, name spaces are normal, you know, but, but if you go to the, to the uh, technical thing, uh, this is rich. For instance, here we have uh, user.new date uh, dot today. Uh, we, this has to be very clear. User is not a class. So it, there's no syntax for classes or modules in, in Ruby. User is a constant. It's an expression. Evaluates to a class object that responds to new, and that returns you uh, a user object, okay? Same with, with today. Today is a constant that evaluates to a certain class object that responds to the today method, okay? So those are expressions. In the day-to-day, -day, we, we say the user constant, the user class, we say the string class, okay? But that, that's a little bit of abuse of language. We, we, we are in, technically, we are dealing about constants and the objects that they store. Constants belong to modules. Uh, each module has, you can think module has many constants, okay? They belong physically to modules. So here, for instance, we are defining a hotel, a, a hotel constant that is going to store a class object, and that hotel constant at the top level belongs to object, all right? 
Then inside that one, we are defining a pricing constant that is going to hold a module object. And that module, that, uh, that constant is going to belong to the module stored in the hotel constant. You, you need the object, okay? It's not about constants, it's the object. The module object is the one that has many constants. So you have to think that modules, module and class objects have like a, like a symbol table where you have constant name to a value, like a hash table, okay? The module and class objects, forget about constants, okay? So the, mo the class object stored in the hotel class, in the, in the hotel constant, has a symbol table where pricing maps to a certain module object. That's how it works, okay? Here, uh, same thing, uh, a different way to define the pricing constant within the hotel class except that in this case, hotel has to be defined. In the previous slide, we were defining or reopening class, uh, the, ho the hotel class. All right, two, con two concepts that are key to understand how this works. The first one is nesting. We are not going to give like precise definitions, but just uh, something uh, close enough to be able to, to understand the, the, the topic of the talk. Nesting. Very briefly, every time you use the class and module uh, keywords, you are, you are pushing class and module objects to something, maintain it internally by interpreter, which is call it the nesting. So in, in every, in every uh, level, you are pushing something to the nesting, okay? So in the, in the first, in the first uh, uh, okay. So here we have two levels, and the nesting here is hotel pricing, which is this guy here, and hotel, which is this class here. Here, we have only one level of nesting. There's only one module keyword, so the nesting is, is only this, uh, this module, all right? Hotel does not belong to this nesting. This is very important to know how constants are resolved. Okay, nesting. Every, every time you see a class or module keyword, you are uh, adding things to the nesting. Okay, this is a lexical thing. You see the file, you, you see the file, you see the, the source code, you see the nesting, lexical. The, the, other, the other concept is the ancestors of a class or module, uh, which you know, uh, for instance, we have here an example with a string. So a string, comparable, and you can check it with this method, okay? Kernel basic object, okay? This is what you use for, for method uh, resolution. Uh, you know this concept of ancestors. All right, so how, how do we resolve uh, constants? For instance, a relative constant like a string, okay? It goes this way. First, you check the nesting. So you are in a, in a certain point in your listing, you go up to the nesting, okay, outwards. If you do not find the constant in the class or modules that conform the nesting, then you go back, you, you, you backtrack and go the ancestors up. So first outwards, nesting, then ancestors up, all right? Then if the inner most, so, so the most um, internal um, class or module is a module, there's a special rule that checks object and that, that is why you are able to find top level constants inside, inside modules. And finally, if you do not find the constant in any of these places, cons missing, cons missing is triggered, which is a callback that you can implement. By default, this callback is the one that raises name error, but you can override that, that thing and, and write your own logic. Then for qualified constants, here we have a, a constant path, okay? The first, the first segment, digest, this is a relative constant, okay? This one is relative digest and is resolved using the previous algorithm. But MD5 is qualified, let's say, qualified. So the resolution of this one is easier. You just check the ancestors of digest, okay? And since 2.5, there's a technicality, that object is a skip it. But that's it, all right? That's what you do. Finally, if you don't find it, cons missing again, all right? That's basically, that's the idea. So, now we are ready to understand how Rails auto load. The classic way, okay? Uh, new terminology, by, by the way. Uh, in Rails, now in Rails 6, we have classic and driver mode. Classic is the one that, that we have used since the beginning, and Zyberg, no, uh, Zyberg mode is the new one. All right, so in Rails we have 
the autoload paths, okay, that represent object. They represent the top level namespace. And Rails defines a cons missing callback. The cons missing callback uh, uh, receives uh, the, the name of the constant that you are uh, missing and goes to the file uh, system and tries to find a file that matches that. But this technique has fundamental limitations. And that is why we find edge cases and we need required dependency to work around them and why sometimes a constant that Ruby would resolve in a way resolves in a different way in Rails. Okay, sometimes you find that kind of edge cases. Uh, and this is because that this technique is fundamentally limit, limited. So for instance, uh, cons missing is called on the module where the constant was missing and is given the name of the constant. That's it, that's the information that you have. So for instance, which is the nesting at that point, you do not know. There's, the API does not give you the nesting. You do not know the nesting. You do, not know, you do not know if the constant was relative or qualified when it was missing. And as, as we saw, those are two uh, key pieces of, of information to, to be able to resolve the constant. You need the nesting uh, uh, in case you have to, to, to walk it. And then you also need to know if it was relative or qualified in order to know which algorithm you have to use, but you do not have that information, okay? So, uh, uh, dependencies RB, which is the, the insider name for autoloading in, in, in the Rails code base, um, did its best, the best that it could uh, with information that it had, okay? It was not perfect, but it couldn't be, it couldn't be perfect, okay? So, indeed, uh, up to a point where, where I, I always said that uh, dependencies RB has its own interface. It, it, you cannot expect a dependencies RB to resolve things like Ruby does. Then another one is that cons missing is the last step in both algorithms. Uh, we, are not, we are now going to see a case in which this just breaks things. And finally, this is not thread safe and Rails has locks here and there to be able to, to make this thread safe in a, in a, in a number of, of spots. All right, uh, cons missing is the last step. So for instance, we have here uh, a hotel class that includes this module. Okay, the intention of someone writing this, let's suppose that is to load this one, okay? The one in your namespace. Let's suppose your intention is this one. But let's suppose that you have also a top level pricing. You have to, you have to know that this, this pricing and this pricing are totally separated entities. This one belongs to object, this one belongs to hotel. They, they have nothing to do with each other, okay? But if by luck you have this one load and this one, this one is not load and you want to auto load, what happens here? Well, Ruby checks the nesting, checks the ancestors and finds this one. So Ruby is able to resolve this constant because it's in, top, in the top level and it's, not going, it's just not going to trigger cons missing. You, you are not even called, okay? So these, these, these things are fundamental problems with the technique uh, that uh, Rails have used since forever. All right, uh, so this is solved by, by Zarbeck. Uh, what do we do? Uh, we are based on module autoload. Module autoload is, a Ruby, AP, is, is, is a, a Ruby API that allows you to set an autoload in a given a class or module in order to be able to load a file that defines a constant when that constant is um, referenced for the first time. The point here is that when I, when I explain it, the algorithms, I skip it something, which is that every time you check if the constant belongs to some of the classes or modules that you are working, the nesting, then the ancestors, every time you check the constant in one of those class, classes or modules, uh, if, the, if the constant is not found, there's, a st there's a still a, a, an additional step, which is if it is not found, do I have an autoload for that constant? If there is an autoload for the constant, at that point, uh, the interpreter requires uh, the file, okay? So this is built in in the logic of the interpreter and it 
it is triggered at the, at the point that you expect the constant to be formed. So, module autoload is, is the technique that, that we need, okay? But uh, in, the, in the last year, so for many years, uh, there were some technical difficulties to implement this based on uh, module autoload that made this technique uh, just not, no, it was not possible, okay? But now it's possible. The idea is that you have autoload paths, uh, root, we, we, I call these root directories in the, in the terminology of the project, but in Rails we, we talk about autoload paths, and we have this module autoload. So the, the way it works is very easy. Let's, let's forget about namespaces because namespaces complicate things, but to get the, to get the idea, when you, when you run setup, you go to the root directories and walk, do, you do one walk, okay? If there is a user.rb, you say, okay, this should be autoloading the user constant in object. So you set an autoload in object. And you set an autoload for, for each of these, of the RB files that you find in the, in the root directories, you are done. You are done because that the merit is, for, is of Ruby, it's not the library, because Ruby with module autoload is going to, is going to uh, load uh, that constant when you expect it. All right, so that's the, that's the technique. The, the, the basic idea is module autoload. From there to the actual implementation, there's work to do, okay? But that was the basic idea. This has still some technical difficulties. For instance, uh, module autoload uses require internally, so if you want to reload, well, uh, you are not going to be able to reload a file uh, uh, two times, because require is going to say, okay, I, I, I already loaded this thing, so I pass. Okay. Indeed, in previous versions of, of Ruby, it was an internal. It was not even kernel required. It was an internal uh, method uh, written in C that was not reachable. Okay. There is no API to remove autoload. This is also uh, important for reloading. Uh, there's no support for namespaces, so you cannot say autoload admin colon colon role. You cannot, you cannot declare that. You, you have to go one step at a time because the autoload has, needs a class or module object, okay? And you are only able to put simple constant names in autoload. Then there is a chicken and egg problem which is very interesting and, and it was the last one that, that, uh, that uh, we needed to solve in order to be able to implement this and indeed I copied the solution for doing this from another gem. Okay, so let's see how do we work around these problems. The first is a very old trick. Uh, so if you require a user the first time, true. If you do it next time, false, all right? Well, how does require know if it has to return false in the second time? Well, because it stores the files that have requ been required in a, in, a, in a global array called loaded features. And that array is mutable, so we remove the file from there and done. We are able to require it two times. So that's, that's what the reloading code does, okay? I told this to, to Matt in the, in the cruise and she, he was like, okay. <laughs> so uh, it, was, it, it, it has been a design principle of the library to stick to the standard API and stick to Ruby semantics. There's few hacks, but they are very, very small and very controlled. Like this, this level of this level of hackiness. Okay, so not it's not very risky. It's not very risky. All right. Remove const in practice removes an autoload. Okay, and indeed the the, con, the there's 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 a dynamic API for dealing with constants. And I have found working with Diverg that, that the, this dynamic API does not distinguish if the constant uh, is actually defined or there is an autoload for, for it. It, it. It treats the two of them more or less uh, in an equivalent way. Then, uh, implicit namespaces. Okay, so we do not have admin.rb in an implicit namespace. This is another little hack, which is that we set an autoload for a directory. Uh, this is not defined at all, okay? This is a little trick. And since autoload nowadays uh, uses kernel require, what the gem does is it has a very thin wrapper uh, around kernel require. So that, that wrapper 
uh, normally it just it just delegates to the to the actual require. But if you pass this directory, you know that that, that, that director that, uh, directory is managed by Enzyberg, and then it, it it intercepts the call, intercepts the call, and then instantiates the dummy module, and then goes one step. Okay, one step. The the gem is lazy, so you are not going to put auto load for all the project tree. It's, it, it, it only does one level at a time, okay? So we are lazy. At, at this point, we are going to go to the admin directory. Maybe admin is defined in several places. So you, you walk all of them and you set one level more. In addition to that, out, the autoload, the file that is going to be autoload is always configured with an absolute path. So in, if you use Enzyberg, uh, that, that uh, performance problem that, that happens when you use um, relative names that have to be resolved against load paths, that is, that is gone, okay? Uh, internally, that's another guideline of the project. Internally, uh, strictly, the gem only uses absolute fine names. And finally, the chicken and egg problem. The chicken and egg problem is the following. You have a class hotel that wants to use this module pricing, which is defined in this, in this uh, um, uh, file. All right. The problem here is that in order to be able to evaluate this file, you need to be able to uh, uh, resolve this, uh, this constant, but this constant is defined here. In order to evaluate this file, you need to have class defined. So you cannot, you cannot go and evaluate any of the two. All right? Okay. Um, the trick to, to resolve this one is trace point. All right? So we set a trace point. This trace point is only enabled if it's needed. If we know that there is an explicit namespace and we are waiting for it, we have a trace point for that, okay? As, as, long, as, as, as soon as all explicit namespaces are resolved, the, the trace point is disabled. It's a trace point on the class event, so it shouldn't be, in practice, it's, it's not a problem, okay? Shopify has this in, in production, okay? So, in practice, it's not a problem. You, you do not define so many classes, okay? Once you are set, you are set, basically, you know, in a regular project. Okay, so we, we define this, this, this uh, trace point, and the, and the thing is that thanks to that trace point, when you evaluate this file, we are called it here. So we are called it here. We know that this is an explicit namespace, and we are on time to go to, to, to the subdirectory, put auto loads, and then pricing is going to be resolved. All right. So that, that is how it works, and that, that is why this gem is going to match Ruby semantics, which is the point of the gem. In Rails 6, it's going to be enabled by default. That means that if you have low defaults in config application that there be, it's going to be uh, just, uh, you're going to be in, in driver mode. Uh, otherwise, if you are doing like a, an upgrade and you are not yet able to uh, uh, activate all the defaults, uh, you can still put this line here and it's going to do it for you. Then it could be the case that Zyberg, so classic mode, uh, in const missing, you get a constant name, and from the constant name, you go to the, to the file system, all right? Zyberg goes the other way around. From the file system, it infers the constants that should define, that should be associated with those files. So these, these, these operations are not inverse of each other, okay? So for instance, if you say HTML underscore, it's going to be HTML in, in lowercase everything. But if you, from, from HTML lowercase, you go to camelize that, uh, they are not inverse of each other, okay? Uh, but in, in Rails, normally, uh, maybe you, can, you, you need to define some acronym or something like that. Uh, it's going, in general, I believe the, the um, uh, upgrades may we need some tweaking and there's going to be documentation because there are some edge cases, but in general, I expect that it mostly works for regular code bases. Finally, if you want to troubleshoot something or want to see the activity of, of the loaders, uh, just, you just throw this thing into, uh, into application RB and uh, you're going to see all the load, all the auto loads, everything that is eager load, all the activities log it, okay? By default, it, it, everything is silent. 
And also, uh, if for some reason uh, your project is not ready for this, you can also opt out just adding this, this thing. If you are in, 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 the, in the six defaults, you just can uh, assign classic to config autoloader, and that allows you to uh, opt out. All right, so that's it. Thank you.